Almost 500 years ago, a relatively unknown Augustinian monk pinned 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. Luther was not aiming at, nor was he hoping for, what came to be called the Reformation. But God used that seemingly at first sight insignificant event for the good of his church and for the cause of the gospel. You see, with God, you just never know. The previous month, Luther had written 97 theses on scholastic theology. Great theses. You should read them. Uh, They are far more theologically significant than the 95 theses. But the 95 theses were used of God to initiate a work of God that impacted and continues to impact the world. With God, you just never know. The most insignificant of events can, in the sovereign good pleasure and purpose of Almighty God, be used for the furtherance of his kingdom and for the extension of his glory in the world. I wonder what comes into your mind when the name Martin Luther uh, is mentioned. What's your first thought? Is it the anguished monk who eventually found peace with God? Is it the bold monk who nailed the 95 Thesis to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg? Was it the uncompromising sacramentalist who pulled the cloth off the table at the colloquy of Marburg in 1530, shouting to Zwingli, you are of another spirit? Or was it the frustrated reformer who, Augustine-like, lost patience with the Jews and descended into what a recent conservative commentator called his nauseating anti-Semitism? Luther began chiding the church for its ill treatment of the Jews and calling on the church. 1523, he wrote a little treatise, calling on the church to show Christian charity and kindness towards those people from whom, according to the flesh, the Son of God came. But by the 1540s, he had lost patience with the Jews. They hadn't turned to the gospel And he wrote the most nauseating, inflammatory, vile works against the Jews. I wonder what kind of Luther comes into your mind. Maybe it's the Luther of the earthly table talk. Um, Luther's good fun. Uh, He's more than good fun. He's embarrassing fun. And at times he's just embarrassing. But... What about Luther, the preacher? The vicar general of the Augustinian order, Johann von Staupitz, encouraged and pressed Luther to become a preacher because it would take his mind off despair. Luther was prone to bouts of terrible darkness. The tests and the trials of life, the Alfechtum, would overcome Luther. Tonight we're going to think a little bit about Martin Luther, the preacher. 
Luther memorably, on one occasion, summed up the task of preaching. First, you must learn to go up to the pulpit. Second, you must know that you should stay there for a time. And third, you must learn to get down again. Now what Luther meant actually was this. You need to have a call from God before you ascend the pulpit. Secondly, you need to have pure doctrine. You need to be there to preach Jesus Christ. Luther at times can seem almost like a well-worn gramophone record. If some of you who are young have any idea what a gramophone record is, he just goes on and on and on. Our primary calling, indeed he would say our exclusive calling is to preach Jesus Christ. He never tired of preaching Christ, he never read of preaching Christ. It's the pure doctrine of Jesus Christ. And thirdly, you must keep the message under an hour. Unlike Calvin, Luther was a highly complex man. He was essentially a medieval man. Calvin had studied law at Orleans. He was very much a man in the humanist tradition. He, like Luther, was a brilliant Latinist, a brilliant Hebrew and Greek scholar. Uh, but Luther was essentially steeped in medieval theology, which is why the 97 Thesis that he wrote in September 1517 are well worth reading. They are an unrelenting blast against Aristotelian theology and philosophy. It makes stunning reading, uh, especially if you know anything about the period and the influence that Aristotle had. On, on the medieval mindset. He was a medieval man, really. And though he dies in uh, 1546, uh, years after the impact of the Renaissance and the Ad Fontes movement back to the sources has impacted the church, Luther remains still in that mindset of the medievalist, in a way that Calvin never did. So what can we learn about Luther, the preacher? Let me mention nine things, and I hope to do so relatively briefly, so let me use my watch. First, Luther prized preaching above everything else he did. The preaching of God's word mattered more to Martin Luther than everything else he did. He wrote, if I could today become a king or an emperor, I would not give up my office as a preacher. Luther was deeply persuaded that three serious abuses had crept into worship services. He wrote, first, God's word has been silenced and only reading and singing remain in the churches. This is the worst abuse. Second, when God's word had been silenced, such a host of unchristian fables and lies in legends, hymns, and sermons were introduced that it is horrible to see. Third, such divine service was performed as a work whereby God's grace and salvation might be won. As a result, faith disappeared, and everyone is pressed to enter the priesthood, convents, and monasteries to build churches and endow them. Now he continues, in order to correct these abuses, know first of all that a Christian congregation should never gather together without the preaching of God's word and prayer, no matter how briefly. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, when they come together, there should be prophesying, teaching, and admonition. Therefore, when God's word is not preached, one had better neither sing, nor read, or even come together. Now, Luther is prone to hyperbole. Uh, he is the master of hyperbole. 
he wrote on one occasion, reason is a whore. And yet, he argued reasonably. He, his preaching was cogent. He, he was noted for these extreme statements. But you see the point he's making. When God's word is not preached, one had better neither sing nor read or even come together. The preaching of the word is what identifies us as the people of God. Very similarly, Calvin writes in Book 4 of the Institutes, if my memory serves me well, the church can exist without the sacraments. It cannot exist without the preaching of the word. So for Luther, the preaching of God's word mattered more than anything else he did. But there was a time in his life when he gave up preaching. For almost nine months in 1530, he hardly preached at all. The reason? Well, it wasn't the great opposition of Rome. It, it wasn't the antics of the Anabaptists. It was the stubbornness of his congregation. He was so disheartened by their spiritual state that he said to them, I am sorry I ever freed you from the tyrants and papists. You ungrateful beasts. You're not worthy of the gospel. If you do not improve, I will stop preaching rather than cast pearls before swine. I would rather preach to mad dogs. Now some of us are preachers here tonight. I wonder if in any way you can identify with Luther. Maybe you'd be too embarrassed to tell anyone if you did. But if that was not in Luther's experience, I, I would be surprised if there wasn't an echo of that. And perhaps even one of us here tonight. Maybe you're in with thinking. I actually know how he feels. Brothers, this is authentic Christian ministry that exists within, I think, every authentic Christian pastor, this double-edged internal battle. We would not exchange our ministerial calling for life, for this world, or for all worlds. We just would not do it. God help us. And yet at the same time, we know what it is to experience discouragement, and maybe even despair. Well, if that's your experience tonight, you should know that you're not alone. Not just because Martin Luther knew that. Our Lord Jesus Christ knew what it was to experience deep, deep discouragement in the work of the ministry. Oh, foolish and slow of heart, how long have I to bear with you. You can almost feel the, the palatableness of the Lord's language as you read those words. What kept Luther from giving up? What kept him from not giving in to his temptation to abandon the stubborn flock back to the people? He tells us simply and powerfully, there is a man whose name is Jesus Christ. He says, no. Him I justly follow as one who has deserved more of me. If you're here today and you're struggling to preach, let me just for a moment speak to my fellow ministers and you're worn out with the ingratitude of your people the man Jesus Christ says no go on go on some of you will know the name Eric Alexander uh, he's one of my dearest friends he's now 86 <coughs> visited him a couple of weeks ago in Glasgow I remember him telling me the first time he went to Westminster Chapel, before they called him uh, to the chapel, which called the thunder, much 
to not turn my Jones's chagrin at him. But he was with someone who knew the doctor. And he told me that after the service, his friend said, we'll wait behind and we'll talk to the doctor. And so they waited in this long queue. And as they got nearer the doctor, Eric said to me, Ian, he seemed to only say one thing to everyone. Go on. Go on. And as we got nearer, I thought to myself, is this all the great man's got to say? These people have been waiting. They've been waiting. They, they want to thank him. They want to express their gratitude. And he's just saying, go on. And then it struck me. What better thing could he say? So brothers, go on. The man, Jesus Christ, says no. Secondly, Luther was persuaded that the word of God is powerful. He wrote, this is the sum of the matter. Let everything be done so that the word may have free course instead of the prattling and rattling that has been the rule up to now. We can spare everything except the word. We profit by nothing as much as the word. One thing is needful. If ever we need to be reminded of that, that surely in these days we can become so concerned with being relevant, with being hip, with being contemporary, and all of these things, apart from being hip, that doesn't suit me, but we need to be relevant, we need to be contemporary, we need to start where people are, not where we would like them to be. But the danger is that we forget the most basic of all truths, that God's word itself the gospel of the grace of God in Jesus Christ is itself natively and compellingly powerful. Preach the word, you pyros, a pyros, in good times and in bad times. Herald the word concerning Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, ascended, reigning, returning. Preach the word. The word of God is natively powerful. Now that for Luther meant two things essential. It meant first of all that the preacher is to expose the ever present reality of fallen human existence. And at the heart of fallen human existence is this Satan initiated prideful thought that we can be right with God through self-righteousness in all its myriad of forms. And for Luther, preaching the word, the word then of God that is powerful in itself, means that we are to confront people with their fallenness, with their lostness. We are to expose the emptiness and the, the deceitfulness of self-righteousness. We are to lay bare the hearts of men and women before God and shine the light of who God is and what God requires of them into their hearts and minds. But along with that, secondly, we are to proclaim that we are right with God only when we are clothed with the crucified Christ's righteousness. Law and gospel. Law and gospel. And that's essentially what Paul does in the opening chapters of Romans, I think. But Luther never forgot this. And Thomas Goodwin puts it so beautifully. If you would know what sin is, go to Mount Calvary. Goodwin wasn't saying you don't go to Mount Sinai. But he is saying the heart and horror of sin in all its awfulness and wickedness and vileness, in all its rebellion, is seen not at Mount Sinai, but at Mount Calvary. And so for Luther, every sermon was to hold out Jesus Christ, not only as the provision of God for the righteousness that we lack, 
But in holding out Jesus Christ for people to see the exceeding sinfulness of sin. For Luther, the word was powerful. He famously said on one occasion, I did nothing. All I did was sit in the tavern at Wittenberg and drink beer with von Amsdorf and Melanchthon. The word did it all. That's another of Luther's exaggerations. But he had confidence that the word of God itself was, was powerful. It was living. It was active. And it needed to be let loose, not dressed up, not hidden behind relevance. Because the gospel is itself relevant. It addresses people where they truly are. So the word of God, the preaching of it, he wouldn't change for anything. He was persuaded, secondly, that the word of God was powerful. But thirdly, Luther, Luther was no less persuaded that the word itself is not enough. The word of God is powerful. That's a graphic theopneustos. But it's not enough. He wrote, nobody who has not the Spirit of God sees a jot of what is in the Scriptures. All men have their hearts darkened. So that even when they can discuss and quote all that is in Scripture, they do not understand or really know any of it. The Spirit is needed for the understanding of all Scripture and every part of Scripture. And that is one of the principal notes of the Magisterial Reformation. The Word is not enough. Calvin puts it like this, you'll know these words well, I'm sure. The testimony of the Spirit is superior to reason. For as God alone can properly bear witness to his own words, so these words will not obtain full credit in the hearts of men until they are sealed by the inward testimony of the Spirit. For though Scripture in its own majesty has enough to command reverence, Nevertheless, it then begins truly to touch us when it is sealed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. I was converted the first time I heard someone speak of John 3.16. It was the only verse that I knew in the Bible, and I only knew it because the man was preaching on it. And apart from David's lament over Saul and Mount Gilboa, which I memorized as a little boy, a little story behind that, I didn't know anything in the Bible. I didn't possess a Bible. My parents never possessed a Bible. A few years later, I met a girl who subsequently went to Ethiopia as a missionary and discovered that she was the ducks at the school the year ahead of me, primary school in East of Glasgow, and we were talking, and she heard I'd become, I'd become a Christian, and I said, you know, my parents sent me for two or three years to local Sunday school. No one ever told me about Jesus. And she looked at me. She said, of course they did. There were believers in that Sunday school. But I, I, I had a clue. I had a clue. don't remember one word of anything that any of them ever said to me. Calvin famously likens the Word of God to spectacles. It's, it's a beautiful uh, metaphor that Calvin develops. His prose is stunning. But what good are spectacles to someone who's blind? They need the Holy Spirit to give them eyes to see. And Luther understood that. I don't know who first said this. It's, it's trite, but it's true. With the Word alone, we dry up. The spirit alone we blow up. The word and spirit together we grow up. A lot that passes for reformed preaching. Well, I can't say that. Some of what passes as reformed preaching 
seems to be acting cordially. Where is the fire? Where is the light? Where is that ministry of the Spirit that opens sin blinded minds? John Owen put it even more dramatically without the Holy Spirit, we may as well burn our Bibles. What do you make of that? Oh, and it's just saying what 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 14 say. Don't have time to unpack those verses. Read them later. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 14. And I think that's what Paul is saying in 1, in 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. That there is this danger of the gospel coming in word only. Not in power. Of the Holy Spirit. is a supernatural act. It's a means of grace. And so our primary focus should never be on technique, though we shouldn't dismiss technique. Not on humour, though I don't think we should dismiss humour. I'm just not naturally funny. Some people are, and, and in its place, that's fine. We need prayer, saturated preaching. We need churches to pray when it gathers together for the Holy Spirit to come down and bless the word that he inspired inherently to the convincing, the convicting, the building up, the establishing of the people of God. Fourthly, Luther preached simply and straightforwardly According to Hughes, all of an old, uh, Luther made no attempt to be a great orator. He had none of the rhetoric of culture that Basil had, or John Chrysostom, or Augustine. He was a popular preacher, and he had a natural mastery of language. And it was Luther who taught, by example, as well as by word, the preachers of the Reformation to preach in the language of the people. He wrote, In the pulpit we are to lay bare the breasts and nourish the people with milk. Complicated thoughts and issues we should discuss in private with the eggheads. I don't think of Dr. Pomeranius, Jonas, or Philip Melanchthon in my sermon. They know more about it than I do. I don't preach to them. I just preach to Hansi and Betty. <laughs> he wrote on another occasion, How I do hate people who lug in so many languages as Zwingli does. He spoke Greek and Hebrew in the pulpit at Marburg. <laughs> he preached simply and straightforwardly. But fifthly, despite those warnings, Luther was firmly committed to the study of the original languages and urged that all preachers have the same passion. Now I always find it uncomfortable reading what Luther and Calvin have to say about the original languages. Listen to Luther. Though the faith and the gospel may be proclaimed by simple preachers without the languages, such preaching is flat and tame. Men grow at last weary and disgusted, and it falls to the ground. But when the preacher is versed in the languages, his discourse has freshness and force. The whole of Scripture is treated, and faith finds itself constantly renewed by a continual variety of words and works. On another occasion, Luther is even stronger in urging the use of the original languages. Listen to this. It is a sin and shame not to know our own book or to understand the speech and words of our God. It is a still greater sin and loss that we do not study languages, especially in these days when God is offering and giving us men and books and every facility and inducement to this study and desires his Bible to be an open book. 
Oh, how happy the dear fathers would have been if they had our opportunity to study the languages and come thus prepared to the Holy Scripture. What great toil and effort it cost them to gather up a few crumbs while we would half the labor, yes, without almost any labor at all, can acquire the whole loaf. Oh, how their efforts put our indolence to shame. One of my close friends divides Bible works. Um, Bible works 10, I, every new edition, I get one. And every time I look at Bible works, it, it really does... It really does pain my conscience. I think how embarrassing it is that I, I need this help to help me navigate through class. You know, I think in the age of religion, I could parse any sentence in English language. You could talk grammar way by that. Bible works, logos, cons, we, we, we have this vast array of helps. I just need to touch a word in my Hebrew Bible on my iPad, everything comes up. Oh, this is a problem. It's, it's great. And here's Luther saying, how happy the dear fathers would be if they had what we now have. You know, Augustine really didn't want to agree. That's why he thought no justification was so deficient. If he'd known Greek, he wouldn't have been led astray by the Lord. Listen to Luther again. It is certain that unless the languages remain, the gospel must firmly perish. So he says, do you inquire what use there is in learning the languages? Do you say we could read the Bible very well in German? Luther answers, without the languages, we could not have received the gospel. Languages are the scabbard that contain the sword of the spirit. They are the casket which contains the priceless tombs of antique thought. They are the vessel that holds the wine. No sooner did men cease to cultivate the languages than Christendom declined, even until it fell under the undisputed dominion of the Pope. But listen to this. But no sooner was this torch relighted and the papal owl fled with a shriek into congenial doom. <laughs> now I think that what Luther Calvin wrote echoed that they just wouldn't let anyone in their pulpit who couldn't read Hebrew and Greek. And I don't mean Be-Rashid Barra Elohim Hashem Certainly in Scotland, a good divinity student had to study Greek and Hebrew. It was compulsory. It was a no-brainer. It was just, it's what you did. I think historically Luther's right. Unless the languages remain, the gospel must finally perish. Now, that can be disheartening for those of us, and I'm certainly one of them, who are not good at languages. I enjoy languages. I enjoy reading grammar, uh, but I'm not good at languages. So listen to what John Piper says. Now that's a discouraging overstatement from Luther, especially for pastors who have lost their Greek and Hebrew. What I would say is that knowing the languages can make any devoted preacher a better preacher, more fresh, more faithful, more confident, more penetrating. But it is possible to preach faithfully without them at least for a season. The test of our faithfulness to the word, if we cannot read the languages, is this. Do we have a large enough concern for the Church of Christ to promote their preservation and widespread teaching and use in the churches, or do we, out of self-protection, minimize their importance because to do otherwise stings deeper. 
Number six, Luther understood that God molds and fashions creatures not in seminaries or in manuals, but in prayer, meditation, and trial. He writes, I want you to know how to study theology in the right way. I've practiced this method myself. Here you will find three rules. They are frequently proposed throughout Psalm 119 and run thus. Oratio, meditatio, tentatio. Prayer, meditation, and trial. Luther is not decrying books and homiletics as such. But he's saying, what? how does God make a preacher? Well, we, we can learn much in seminaries, and, and that's good, up to a point. Seminaries don't make preachers. <coughs> Meditation on scripture, on God, prayer, and trial. Testing. Sometimes the trials are severe. We have spoke to us earlier that we can try out why? Why? Life is hard. And all the time God is seeking to mould us and make us in the likeness of the Son. You know, the Spirit's ministry of replication, Calvin puts it. What the Spirit first accomplished in Christ, he takes as a template to lay over the lives of all his people and not these, and those who he calls into the pastoral ministry. And the Lord Jesus Christ described the whole of his life as the time of my trial. These were the hermeneutical means that shaped the preaching ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, that shaped Luther's ministry, that shaped Calvin's ministry. And we can be sure that much of our preaching ministry, and some of us who are here who are preachers, and some of us would be preachers, we can be sure that our ministry will be forged for good or for ill by these three means, prayer, meditation, and trial. Yes, we should read books. Learn from them. But if you read through Psalm 119, I've more understanding than all my teachers because I obey. When I studied homiletics, I didn't have any professors say to me, you know, you, the way to be the man God has called you to be as a pastor is to practice the life of obedience. That will do more than anything else to instruct you Early in Psalm 119, he says, In my sufferings, you have taught me how to speak. These are the great hermeneutical means that God uses. Seventhly, Luther was the most human of preachers. In July 13, 1521, he wrote to Philip Melanchthon from the Bartholomew Castle while he was supposedly working feverishly on the translation of the New Testament. I sit here at ease, hardened and unfeeling, alas, praying little, grieving little for the church of God, burning rather than the fierce fires of my untamed flesh. It comes to this, I should be a fire in the spirit. In reality, I am a fire in the flesh, with lust, laziness, idleness, sleepiness. It is perhaps because you have all ceased Pray for me that God has turned away from me. For the last eight days I've written nothing, nor prayed, nor studied, partly from self-indulgence, partly from constipation and piles. I really can't stand it any longer. Pray for me, I beg you. There's just something so human about this. Stuff. You know, you, you just can't but warm to him. He's just so honest. Sometimes the honesty is embarrassing. But what is it he says? Pray for me. How often Paul would conclude that, you know, not pray God will pray for me. Pray that an open door will be opened for me. Pray for me.
we mustn't lose our humanity and submerge our humanity beneath evangelical reform pretense. You read the letters in particular, say of Luther or Calvin, the humanity just pours. <coughs> there's nothing false, there's nothing pretends, there's nothing tween. They're just real, they're honest. And I think in preaching, we need wisely, not unthinking, unthinkingly, but wisely to expose our humanity to our congregations. They need to realize that we are sheep before we're shepherds. But they, they, they need to realize that, that, yes, the great Savior of heaven has a fellow feeling for them in their infirmities, but the man who stands before them speaking the word of their Savior is a frail child of this. And who will be saying either vocally or internally, please pray for me. Please pray for me. If you do anything for me, pray for me. Pray for me. Isn't it remarkable how often Paul would tell congregation, I'm praying for you. When did you last say to someone, I just want them to know, I, I pray for you. Someone said that to me recently. Eighthly, Luther understood that ministerial solitude can lead to spiritual disaster. Earlier this year, a friend of mine, a renowned reform minister, took his life. I spent a lot of time with my own wife, Joan, with his widow over the past few months. Preached a few times in his church. By all accounts, he was a private man. Luther understood that ministerial solitude can lead to spiritual disaster. He wrote, Throughout life, a faithful friend is a very great blessing and a very precious treasure. This is true not only in view of the ordinary, dangerous difficulties in which he can offer help and consolation, but also in view of spiritual temptations. For even though your heart is thoroughly confirmed by the Holy Spirit, there is nonetheless a great advantage in having a friend with whom you can talk about religion and from whom you may hear words of comfort. Calvin put it more simply, solitude leads to great abuse. Oscar Wilde, uh, going from Calvin to Oscar Wilde, some of the stretch, but Oscar Wilde wrote that a friend is someone who stabs you in the stomach. If you were here tonight as a private man, a private woman, you don't, you, you don't let people get to you. Cry to God to deal with that sin. Especially in the Christian ministry, do not live in ministerial isolation. Now, for some of us, that's easier than for others. Temperament comes in. There's no theology without psychology. We can't not be what we are. And it takes more effort for some of us. However hard it may be, cultivate friends to whom you can open your heart. Best of all, your wife, if you have one. And if you don't have one, find one. He who finds a wife is a good thing. Look for one. I hope you're looking. God may in his good pleasure and purpose not give you one, but it shouldn't be for the want of trying. You know, look, search, pray. Find a godly woman who gets your blood racing a little. And who loves the Lord. Ministerial solitude lies at the heart, I think, probably of most ministerial players. I wonder why so many men, not to speak of women, get drawn into internet pornography. I was at a conference in the States 
couple of years ago in one of the other speakers um, who has written a number of books on sexual matters, Christian faith. He said, and I'm just listening, and suddenly he said he, th he thinks that 50% of men in good evangelical churches indulge in internet pornography. I sat there. I thought, is he serious? I thought, if he is remotely right, I have failed two congregations signally over 35 years. You see, the danger is when a particular sin isn't a sin that troubles you, the other sin that troubles me, that in the Lord's mercy doesn't trouble me, hasn't got, please God, not to there. Other sins, egregious sins, pride, the greatest of all sins, the desire to be well thought of. But how many men have been drawn into that vicious, vile seduction because of ministerial isolation. However hard it may be, cultivate friends to whom you can open your heart. Luther understood that. Throughout life, a faithful friend is a very great blessing. I put two or three or four particularly close friends in the ministry to whom I think I could share <coughs> Almost anything over with my life, I share everything with the thing. I have a secret song. We've never once argued in 37 years. I don't mean we always think alike. Uh, we've never argued. Uh, I don't think that's something to boast about. That's why I'm not, that's why I'm, I'm not saying it for that reason. I do think also with the soundtrack of that, I do think we have the expectations of the world. Children are going to adolescence, this and uh, teenage <coughs> that. Why? Why? Number nine. Close with this. Luther knew from the Bible of his own experience that gospel preaching is not only demanding but hazardous. Listen to these words. Those who are in the teaching office should teach with the greatest faithfulness and expect no other remuneration than to be killed by the world, trampled underfoot, and despised by their own. Teach purely and faithfully, and in all you do expect not glory, but dishonour and contempt, not wealth but poverty, violence, prison, death, and every danger. Now Luther was writing at a particular time, wasn't he? We're increasingly living in an age when the spiritual capital of the last 500 or so years is being rapidly exhausted. And who knows, even in my limited life, <coughs> of what remains of it for me, what that will mean for me, but what will it mean for young men like Jacob? Expectation do we have? The Lord Jesus says, unless you take up your cross daily and follow me, you cannot be my minister. No, he didn't say that, did he? You can't be my disciple. He didn't mean unless you're willing to allow people to call you names and uh, publicly call you out and write about you in the press. He says, unless you're willing to die, forget about being my disciple. Interesting, we had a lie, a spiritual lie detector test. Someone says, I want to be a Christian. So you plug them up and you're ready to die. Uh -huh. Die? <laughs> What's all this about death? Well, Jesus said, unless you take up the cross, the instrument of execution daily, and follow me, you can't be my disciple. The chief aim of Luther's preaching was to acquaint his congregation with the great truths of the Bible and especially of Jesus Christ the Savior. He said, we preach always Jesus Christ. This may seem a limited and monotonous subject likely to be soon exhausted, but we are never at the end of it. We're never at the end of it. So preach Jesus Christ. I read a few years
years ago, uh, Søren Kierkegaard, the 19th century Danish philosopher, theologian, he wrote some good things, some lots of good things. But he said life is 70,000 fathoms deep. Now, I'm actually a quite good swimmer, and with a decent dive, the fullness of the Godhead problem. You can never exhaust preaching Jesus Christ, who is the gospel. That's why we should never preach faith or grace. We should never preach sermons about grace or faith or obedience or repentance, but repent for thought. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith always takes theologically and directly. Let me finish with Luther's advice to preachers. He said, a good preacher should have these virtues. First, to teach systematically. Second, he should have a ready wit. Third, he should be eloquent. Fourth, he should have a good voice. Fifth, a good memory. Sixth, he should be open to stop preaching. Seventh, he should be sure of his doctrine. Eighth, he should engage body and blood, wealth and honour in serving the word. Ninth, he should suffer himself to be mocked and jeered by everyone. Mocked and jeered by everyone. Why? Because as it was with the master, so it will be with the servant. Some of you may know Amy Carmichael's poem, Hast thou no scar? Hast thou no scar? No scar in hand or wood, wound or sun? I hear thee sun as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? No scar on hand, or foot, or side, but such were the masters. And as the master shall the servant be, and peers are the feet that follow me, can he have followed far who has no wound, no scar?